check out our websites, biblequery.org. This site answers 7,700 Bible questions. Historycart.com. This site reveals early church history and doctrine proving Roman Catholicism is not historically or doctrinally viable. MuslimHope.com. This site is a classic refutation of Islam, a counterfeit religion created by Muhammad. Free newsletters are also available. Hello, this is Larry Wessels with just a quick message to our viewers to check out our main YouTube channel, Sea Answers TV, which stands for Christian Answers Television, where we have all of our over 610 videos posted. By going there, you can see all of our videos organized by playlist, categorized by subjects. Once you scroll down past our Bible prophecy trailer at the top of the channel page, the playlist begin. You'll see our recent uploads playlist, followed by our most popular videos playlist, followed by our playlist on Jehovah's Witnesses, then Islam, the Muslim religion, then Roman Catholicism, Darwin's metaphysical evolution religion, Seventh-day Adventism, dealing with anti-Trinitarians and early church history, our multiple playlists, which includes God-hating atheists, phony TV preachers and King James onlyists, dealing with UFOs, ghosts, spiritual warfare, our radio shows with national Christian authors and our music bids, the Black Muslims, Louis Farrakhan, and the Nation of Islam, Mormonism, Hell, Lake of Fire, Unpopular Bible Doctrines, Antichrist, Cults, New Age, and World Religions. Charles Haddon Spurgeon, Jonathan Edwards, and Spanish videos. End times, supernatural prophecies, and tough Bible questions. And our playlist dealing with predestination, Arminianism, and Calvinism. Our YouTube channel is built to help people learn the Bible and defend their Christian faith against false prophets that come against it from every side. Jude verses 3 and 4. At the time of this recording, our channel has already been blessed with over 6 million viewings and over 10,000 subscribers. And now, for our main video presentation. The Roman Catholic Church endeavors to overturn the Reformation. Welcome to the program. That is a very strong title for what is actually happening historically at the present time in 2016. And it is of utmost importance that we understand what I am going to document before you in this video. Historically, at the time of the Reformation, the Counter-Reformation coming against the great truths of the Reformation was led by the Jesuits in different parts of Europe. And now a Jesuit, Pope Francis, is leading the endeavor to overturn the actual Reformation and all that the Reformation stands for. As we will see what he has planned later on in 2016 and what has been planned also simultaneously in England. And so the primary purpose of the Roman Church has always been to overthrow the very principles of the Reformation, those great five principles of biblical truth, that an individual is saved on the authority of Scripture alone, 
by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ Jesus alone, and to God only be the glory. It's those wonderful principles that have saved multitudes right through the time of the Reformation and after the Reformation and to the present day where there is a moving of God's Spirit. It's always those five biblical principles. And so we have to understand just what is at stake and uh, how the Reformation is being attempted to overthrow it. The Jesuitical practice that's employed is the same as what was laid out on Jesuitical principles of Second Vatican Council II in, in 1965 to try and slowly but surely bring people back to Romanism and out of biblical truth. So what are the facts now in the year 2016? In 2016, the skilled Jesuit Pope Francis is attempting to overturn the Reformation by working with the Lutheran World Federation. And this is to take place in Sweden in, on October the 31st, 2016. The very day of the Reformation, October the 31st. And I'd like to quote the exact words from the Catholic news service where this was reported on. To participate in an ecumenical service and the beginning of a year of activities to mark the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation. Pope Francis will lead an ecumenical commemoration in Lund alongside Bishop Munnert Yunan, President of the Lutheran World Federation, and the Reverend Martin Unge, Federation General Secretary, said the joint press report by the Pontifical Council for Promoting Christian Unity. The apostasy of the Roman Catholic Church and the Lutheran World Federation was already attested on October the 31st 1999, when they came together for what was called the Joint Declaration on the Doctrine of Justification. That was quite well known at the time in 1999, on October the 31st, where they agreed to Roman Catholic idea of grace being conferred through sacraments and not imputed as the biblical messages, for example, the word imputed used 11 times in Romans chapter 4. The idea of conferred coming through sacraments. The Roman idea was agreed to by the Lutherans at that, that declaration of, um, of on the doctrine of justification in 1999. And um, now it is the same Lutheran Federation that is working together. And I'd just like to read a section from that uh, document that came out in 1999, where it was said in that document, we confess together that in baptism, the Holy Spirit unites one with Christ, justifies and truly renews a person. That was October the 31st, 1999, section four, paragraph four. And um, it shows that baptism, looking to a physical sacrament or ritual, that a person would be renewed and justified. <laughs> no physical sacrament justifies anybody, but 
the Lutherans agreed to that. And of course, the Roman Catholic Church have always looked to their sacraments as being conveying God's grace, rather than, as the scripture says, there's only one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. It's only in Christ Jesus, the Lord directly, the Lord God through Jesus Christ justifies you and me as we trust in Christ alone and not in any ritual. So biblical truth was denied in 1999. And now again, plans are made that a similar declarations would be made as the Pope meets in Sweden together with the Lutherans and other ecumenical endeavors so that all would be united, <laughs> as it were, under Rome and uh, not under Christ Jesus the Lord and the scriptures alone. It was justification by God's grace alone, through faith alone, that was Martin Luther's great principle that started the Reformation or that helped start because there was many others that simultaneously at the same time who were coming to that biblical truth as we'll see later on. Furthermore, on February the 9th, 2016, the Catholic News Service, besides telling what was going to happen in October, where the Pope would meet with the Lutheran Federation in Lund, it also made another statement, and I'd like to read exactly from this statement that is still on the internet. It said, quotation, the Archbishop of Westminster hosted an evening prayer service at the former home of King Henry VIII. It was the first time a service had been conducted at the palace's chapel royal according to the Latin rite of the Catholic Church in more than 450 years, end of quotation. And so this latest endeavor by the Jesuit Pope Francis is similar to what happened already when Pope Benedict XVI visited the United Kingdom in 2010. Efforts were made then to thwart the Reformation. The visit at the time was called, quotation, an unprecedented opportunity to strengthen ties between the United Kingdom and the Holy See on global initiatives, as well as the important role of faith in creating strong communities. End of quotation. That was from Benedict XVI. And uh, it was in 2010 when he visited the United Kingdom and was in London. And now it is that the, what Benedict had said is being again implemented as the Archbishop of Westminster has a service in Latin according to Roman rite where Henry VIII had resided at the Chapel Royal. And so these ecumenical endeavors are now proceeding and there possibly will be more as this year goes on, but it's for us to understand what is documented and see that we need to understand the actual facts of the Reformation and to review historically what the Reformation was because as a, a, a concerted effort to overturn the Reformation, we need to understand what the Reformation was and the historical facts of the Reformation. And so let us take a look backwards in history to see just what the Reformation faith was and why it was that Europe was changed 
from that time onwards, and the, the, the fruit of the Reformation is still seen in so many, many biblical churches across America, Europe, and other parts of the world, Australia, New Zealand, and on and on, the English-speaking world, and in, in other languages as well, the Reformation is seen because of what happened at the Reformation. So what was the authentic faith of the Reformation? Martin Luther in Germany, John Calvin, Lefebvre, and Farrell in France, and Zwingli in Switzerland, all represent what had been Reformation faith at that time in the 16th century. The essential essence of, of um, biblical faith was that an individual, a sinner, is saved by God's grace alone, based on Scripture alone, through faith alone, in Christ Jesus alone, and all to the glory of God alone. And it is all summarized by the text in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourself, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Not of works. The very thing that the Roman Church major on works, their sacraments. The scripture says, not of works, lest anyone should boast. The plight of the biblical position of you and me before we're saved is quite clear in Romans. It is depicted in chapter 3. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. In Romans 3 and verse 23 being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. We are justified freely by God's grace, and that is the wonder of, and if you have your Bible, you can look up Romans 3, 23, 24, and 26. And it is the wonder of Reformation faith. It is biblical. It's directly from God in Christ. It's no church, <laughs> no church ritual. It is the grace of God alone, and to God be the glory. And the, um, the Reformation possessed distinctive characteristics, many of which set it apart from all other uh, facts of history. It had distinctive characteristics. It was a territorially wide reformation. It happened spontaneously in different European countries at the same time. It was Martin Luther, John Calvin, and Lefebvre, as we said, in, uh, started it, Martin Luther, of course, in Germany, Calvin and Lefebvre in, in, um, in France, and Zwingli in Switzerland. And they all were abhorred by the Roman Catholic looking to rituals. And they saw that it was by grace alone, directly in Christ Jesus, that one is saved. Although Martin Luther is sometimes said to be the one who initiated the Reformation of the originator, to some extent he was that, but at the same time, these other people were arising giving the same message as he was, justification by grace alone. And so we have to see what was the, what was the power principle? What was it all based on? It was uh, all based on the truth of the, the Word of God, that God's Word is supreme. Martin Luther spoke eloquently to the heart of God's people. And I'd like to quote what he said, because those words should ring not only in your ears, but in your heart. And uh, Mart what Martin Luther said at those times is something that still is true. It was true for Martin Luther, it should be true for you and for me. Unless I am convinced by scripture and plain reason, I do not accept the authority of popes and councils, 
for they have contradicted each other. My conscience is captive in the Word of God. I cannot and I will not recant anything, for to go against conscience is neither right nor safe. Here I stand. I cannot do otherwise. God help me. Amen. Here I stand. Those great words of Martin Luther. Here I stand. He stood on God's written word alone. That is our criteria for truth. The word of God alone. And if we read in the four Gospels, we see that Christ Jesus again and again had the same principle that he enunciated. It was always the written word of truth. When Satan tried to tempt Christ Jesus in the wilderness, Jesus answered the prince of demons by saying, it is written. It is written. It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. That's how man lives, how you and I live, not by bread alone, but by every word. Christ Jesus identified in John chapter 17, verse 17, thy word is truth. Not simply that God's word contains truth. It is truth. There's an identity between truth and the written word of God. That is what Christ Jesus said. And it is, uh, it is the message that again and again the Apostle Paul reiterated, and this, of course is in Scripture. And it is quite clear in that wonderful text that you should have memorized and that we all should have memorized that 2 Timothy chapter 3, 16 and 17. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God might be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. It's profitable for everything. That is the glory of biblical truth. When we reach that foundation, we have the solid foundation as Christ Jesus proclaimed, as the apostles proclaimed, as all men and women of biblical faith have always proclaimed and lived. It is God's word alone that is truth. And it is the endeavor that we have to come against as the Roman church upholds their tradition as on a par with and equal to the written word of God. And um, we will see that the um, Luther was held and his conscience was held by the word of God. And he saw that the, it was the word of God and the word of God alone that is the truth. And I think it's important that we document and look at what is the official position of the Roman Church on this regard. And I'd like to read the exact words from the Catechism of the Catholic Church and uh, to see what they say about truth and where it is to be found. And I'm reading from paragraph 80, first of all. Sacred tradition and sacred scripture then are bound closely together and communicate one with another. <laughs> Somehow, sacred tradition, which they put first, <laughs> and sacred scripture communicate. There's, there's a sort of an intercommunication. If you look at any Bible, it doesn't seem to be communicating with anything, but this is the strange teaching, the official word, word for word, of the Roman Church in paragraph 80 of their Catechism. Paragraph 81, and holy tradition transmits in its entirety the Word of God, which has been entrusted to the apostles by 
Christ the Lord and the Holy Spirit. Holy tradition, they call it holy tradition, transmits or gives to people the Word of God. Where did you get this from? <laughs> holy tradition, giving people the Word of God. It's the Lord God by the Spirit that gives us the written Word of Truth. <laughs> How dare any institution or church say this? that holy tradition transmits in its entirety the Word of God. And there, then their conclusion in paragraph 82, and I read word for word, and you can check this online, and you can see it, that this is exactly word from word from the Catechism of the Catholic Church. As a result, the Church does not derive her certainty about all revealed truths from the Holy Scriptures alone. Both Scripture and tradition must be accepted and honoured with equal sentiments of devotion and reverence. Equal sentiments of devotion and reverence for sacred tradition as <laughs> the Word of God. Look at the level, this is, on, this is a real serious level. This is of what is truth. This is like a man looking at his wife and saying, well, I love you, honey, and I have uh, love and reverence for you, but of equal love and reverence for my secretary. <laughs> what would you think of that man? You say, he must be an adulterer. How can any church say these words that the Roman church says? Both scripture and tradition must be accepted with equal sentiments of devotion and reverence. That is horrendous. That very truth has been enough to bring multitudes, thousands, and if we add up throughout the years, millions of people to biblical truth, that they saw that truth is in the scripture alone and not in any sacred tradition of what is called a church. <laughs> it's more like a system, but how could any church teach this? Equal sentiments of devotion and reverence for sacred scripture and sacred tradition. Tradition is put on a par with scripture. And so I'd ask you to check and you can get a catechism of the Catholic Church easily. You can purchase or you can see it online. It's very easy to see. Read that and be horrified as many others. And it's good if you are a Catholic and you are horrified, praise God, because that will lead to giving you a basis of truth. And when you have a basis of truth, you are all ready to accept the great truths of salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, and in Christ Jesus alone. And so we must go back now to be tracing the history of the Reformation. The learning at the time was remarkable. At the, at the Reformation, there was scholarship right across Europe, and there was great fraternization and developed between the different reformers, but there was a learning was a way of life, and it was amazing to see just how scholarly these men were. Men who understood and were educated so that they could read the scriptures in Hebrew, in Greek, and in Latin. As the Bible existed at the time. And this was the remarkable thing that we have from the time of the Reformation. And so it was that we had these, we had the Bible translated. Later on as the Reformation developed, all the Luthers and the Latimers and the Zwinglies and the Knoxes and the Wishards and all the other great reformers from the time of the Reformation all, would not have had any place had the ordinary man and woman not had a Bible. 
And so it was at the time of the Reformation, the printing press was in existence, and we had, while Latimer was preaching at Cambridge, William Tyndale was off to the continent translating the scriptures into English and having them smuggled back into England so that the man who ploughed the field and the young boy with him could have the scriptures in their own language. That was his heart's desire and that happened. Many, many thousands of people came right across England to have, first of all, New Testaments and then the whole Bible in English. And we are so grateful to Tyndale, who gave his very life for the principle at the end. As you know, he was burnt by the Roman Church at the stake. William Tyndale, the one who got the Word of God in English to the English people. And it is similarly that we had the Word of God going forth. We know that Martin Luther himself translated the Bible into German, and that German Bible basically, going back to Martin Luther, is still the basis of the, the uh, German Bible as we have it today. And we have it also, it was the same in France and in the other European countries. We had the languages in the, of the people, the language of the Bible in their, own, in their own language. And that was the glory of the Reformation, that people, every man and woman and young people had the Bible. It was just, it was, the, it was a remarkable thing about the Reformation. The heritage of the Reformation, how did it all happen? And how do Reformations happen? Because those Reformation after the Reformation, many other Reformations occurred in the different centuries that were to follow. How did it all occur? The great Spurgeon wrote and described it, and it's still there on the internet. You can check it out, the words of Spurgeon about how the heritage of the Reformation came about and spread. He said, think not that Luther was the only man that wrought the Reformation. There were hundreds who sighed and cried in secret, O oh God, how long, in the cottages of the Black Forest, in the homes of Germany, on the hills of Switzerland, in the palaces in Spain, in the dungeons of the Inquisitions, in the green lanes of England. Those who cried out, O oh God, how long? Those who prayed for reformation. Prayer is the bedrock of all reformation. Prayer that God would reform and change the hearts of men and women. And so it is that it was prayer was the bedrock of the Reformation and for what has happened since then. I spoke of other Reformations since then. We had the Great Awakening in the United States in the 18th century and in Britain, both associated with Jonathan Edwards and George Whitfield. And prior to that, we had the outpouring of God's grace and the lives of thousands of people and their associates, for example, in Northern Ireland, Ulster, in 1859, a great revival. And at the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century, we had great revivals in Wales and in other European countries. What is our conclusion? Our conclusion is that the reformers knew, relished, and enjoyed biblical faith, not only intellectually, but most important, in their own heart. They had come to trust in Christ alone and not any rituals. So many had come from the rituals of Rome and they knew how dead they were, that you were supposed to be have received sanctifying grace when the priest poured water on your head when you were a baby. <laughs> and then you're supposed to have 
received absolution when the priest gave you absolution uh, and said, I forgive you for all your sins in the name of the Father, and Son, and Holy Spirit. You are supposed to have received Christ in a piece of bread that he was somehow hidden, not coming back, as he said, from east to west, every eye would see him when he comes back, not in, but in a concealed way, in a piece of bread. You were supposed to have received Christ in a piece of bread in the way for a communion. And you were supposed to pray not to God alone, but to Mary and to the saints. The great principles of the Reformation was that it's grace alone, faith alone, in Christ alone, and to God only be the glory. You only talk to God or worship God in prayer. You don't offer prayer to Mary and the saints. It's God alone. You pray to God alone, as we see in the pages of Scripture and as we see in the lives of men and women who've really known the Lord. They treat God as God and not treat people as if they could hear prayers in different languages simultaneously right across the world. Those attributes are attributes of God. Now, this is quite serious. We see what's going to happen in Lund when they, at the end of this year, the 31st of October, that Pope Francis and the Lutherans are to meet to commemorate the Reformation. This is horrendous because this is not going to be a commemoration. This is an endeavor to say that we're all one. We're back to trusting sacred tradition as well as scripture. We're back to trusting rituals and not the power of God alone in Christ Jesus. We're back to not just praying to God alone, but praying to Mary and the saints. That is backwards. That is attempting to overthrow the Reformation. And what we're seeing before us is an example of what is spoken of in Romans chapter 5, verse 17. Scripture speaks about the offense, about abomination. And let me read the exact words of Romans chapter 5, verse 17. For if by one's man offense, death reigned by one, much more they which receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness might reign in life by one Jesus Christ. The abomination is that there's an attempt made to overturn the Reformation. It's begun and will come to a height the 31st of October 2016. It's like death is beginning to reign or the Roman Church wants it to reign. But the scripture says much more might the grace of God and the gift of righteousness reign in life by Jesus Christ. As we see this abomination, let's pray that grace will reign. God is more powerful than any institution or any pope <laughs> claiming to represent Christ. God is supreme. God is sovereign. <laughs> It's not any pope <laughs> sitting on a, with his mitre in Rome pontificating. It's God who's sovereign. May grace reign through righteousness. And that is our heart's cry. And may it be so. And may, may many hear this message. And I pray that if you today are listening and you do not know Christ, if you are from a Roman background and you've just always done the rituals and you've always believed what the Pope said and you've always believed what Francis said and the Popes before that, and, and now you see how empty it is. It's not just that you're aghast at the immorality of the priest that has been publicized for these many years and horrified by the fact that 
The Roman Church does not produce fruit of living the five principles of the Reformation or having the fruits of the Spirit, the Scriptures speak, love, joy, peace, joy, self-control. It doesn't have the fruits of the Spirit. It doesn't have the Reformation principles. It has rituals and what they call sacred tradition. If you have lived a Roman life like I did for 48 years, and then you see the truth of Scripture alone, and you cry out to God for His grace, He is faithful and true. I know multitudes, multitudes of beloved dear brothers and sisters in the Lord who that has been true for, not just me, but multitudes. See of the, of the 70 videos or so that I've made, see the interviews with former uh, priests like, uh, like Henry Narkowski, and uh, or the former nuns that I've interviewed or the former Catholics I've interviewed and see hearts at low of people who have come to God's grace. That last book that I had published on the wings of grace alone, the testimonies of 30 converted Catholics ring with joy, those Catholics. And I'm happy that I was able to interview some of these people on video like A.J. Krauss, and what a glory it was to see him explaining the joy, unspeakable and full of glory, that is in his heart as he came beyond Romanism into biblical truth. So may it be for you, dear listener. So may it be for you. And it will be a joy to hear from you. I know that this video goes out and it goes out not just on YouTube, but on Vimeo and Archive and other web pages. And we get multitudes of emails from people, and I thank God for that. But no matter how many we get, I have a dear brother in the Lord, Pastor Glenn, who helps me. And we will answer your email if you email us. It may take us a few many days to answer, but we will answer personally. We always do. Myself or Pastor Glenn. And my email address is there on your screen. It's easy to remember. Richard M. Bennett at yahoo.com. M is my initial, middle initial for Michael. Richard M. Bennett at yahoo.com. Let us hear from you. And it it's, it's always such a joy. It warms my heart, and it's one of the things I take great delight in in making videos is the response that we get. And if you're willing to make a stand for biblical truth, what we have documented in this video today is of horrendous proportions, the plans for October the 31st, the end of this year, and what is happening in England simultaneously at the Chapel Royal of what had been the palace of Henry VIII. What these things that are being planned and will be further implemented is horrendous. But let grace reign through righteousness and let us hear that you're making a stand for biblical truth. And let me hear from you if you're able to get this video up on other web pages besides where we have it on church web pages and you're able to further the URL of this to your friends, let me hear from you. And let me hear that you are making a stand. And if you have something yourself to write, write it and send it to us. And um, if it is such that we think it should be posted, we will post it on our Reformation, uh, uh, Historical Reformation's webpage, BereanBeacon.org, which stands for Biblical Truth, BereanBeacon.org. And if you want to make a video yourself, why not make a video on Skype? 
on this very topic yourself and let us hear that you have this posted. And that's always a joy to me to hear from brothers and sisters that they're making a stand. And it's, it gives joy to my heart to know that others are making a stand. And it'd be lovely to hear that you also are making a stand for biblical truth and that the word is going forth. And so may God be glorified and may Christ Jesus be honored. And may there be a fresh outpouring in our day. We read from Spurgeon's quotations about people crying for revival. Pray, pray that there would be a moving of the Spirit. I had the privilege in 2008 to visit Stornoway on the Isle of Lewis in Scotland. And I got speaking at the town hall in Stornoway. And the joy to me was such because Stornoway was where there was a great revival. And to this day, the reformation that started in Stornoway, Isle of Lewis, Scotland, still continues. You can see the strong biblical faith in the north of the Isle of Lewis. And where it did not happen, in the south of the Isle of Lewis, it will break your heart to see Romanism embedded in the culture and the deadness of people's lives bound up in rituals. I remember visiting the South, having seen the glory of the North on the Isle of Lewis. And that typifies things as they can be in the heart and souls of men. Are you dead in rituals? Or are you alive in the very principles? At the time of the Reformation, it was credited and said that even the young children at the time knew the principles. Do your, your boy and girl that you've taught at home, do they know the five biblical principles? Teach them. Teach your daughter. Teach your son. The truth is, based on Scripture alone, that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ Jesus alone, and to God only be the glory. Those are the five biblical principles. Get your children to be able to recite them. And most of all, live them, and God will be glorified, and souls will be saved. And as you go to the supermarket, and you ask the checkout gal or the man at the checkout counter, have you read your Bible today? And they say, well, yes and no. And then you explain that we're all sinners before a holy God, trust in Christ and Christ alone. You give the gospel in everyday life, you will see that the power of God in everyday life to save. And that's always a joy to me. We not only know these truths, but we speak about them in everyday life. Have you witnessed to your hairdresser, ladies, <laughs> when you come back from visiting the hairdresser, can you say that I witnessed to her today? Or can you, as a man, say that when I went to the gas station or the petrol station, as they call it in England, and and I witnessed to the person whom I paid for, for my gasoline or for the petrol, whatever it is. Have you witnessed that in the bank? Have you witnessed to the life of Christ Jesus? The Reformation is real and let us bring it down to everyday life and see souls saved. And it is such a joy to know that we have Reformation truth. And so it's not Lund, and the Jesuit, the Jesuit uh, Pope, and it's not these that we fear, it's the glory of God that we rejoice in and that souls will be saved. And we know that this word will go forth and we know that you also will be part of it. 
And as you come to biblical faith, those of you who have trusted in Christ alone, by grace alone, let us hear, as I said, from you, and we'll give all glory to God alone. And so we thank God for Reformation 500. We celebrate it with joy unspeakable because the Lord is glorified. And may his word go forth, and may God be glorified in the souls of men and women. If you would like a free newsletter on this or other subjects, just give us a call at Christian Answers. The phone number is area code 512-218-8022. That's 512-218-8022. Or you could email us at cdebater at aol.com. That's cdebater at aol.com. Thank you. Hello, this is Larry Wessels, Director of Christian Answers of Austin, Texas, Christian Debater Ministries. I'm pleased to introduce to my audience a dear brother in the Lord, Richard Bennett, Director of Berean Beacon Ministries, an outreach to Roman Catholics. It is great to be here, Larry. For people that don't know you, you were a Roman Catholic priest for 22 years. Is that right? Please give us a short account of your life. Yes, I was a Catholic priest for 22 years. I was a Catholic altogether for 48 years, having grown up in Dublin, Ireland. I was trained uh, very early on in my education, in what we call secondary and elementary education, uh, by the Jesuits. And then I decided to become a Catholic priest, and I spent eight years in preparation. It was a novitiate year, and then six years to ordination when I was ordained a priest in Dublin, Ireland in 1963, and then one year in Rome, eight years in all. Then I spent uh, 21 years in uh, Trinidad West Indies as a parish priest carrying out the, the work of a priest. I had the best academic training you could get finishing up in the city of Rome itself near the Vatican, and I, I really had a desire to bring P Catholics to uh, what we thought was a way of being right with God so that they could get to purgatory and then that they finally could get to heaven. And I was great for doing penances and sacrifices. And then I was very devout in Trinidad, uh, uh, baptizing babies, hearing people's confessions and doing all the sacraments. It was in 1972, I had a very serious accident where I was three days unconscious after the serious accident and then after that time when I got out of the hospital in the sanatorium I began searching in the Bible for what is true. It took me 14 years of comparing the Bible to Catholicism before I realized that I was dead in trespasses and sins and it was by grace alone that we are saved. I One night I got on the floor in my house and I cried out to God for faith and his grace to save a wretch like me, dead in trespass and sins, and he gloriously did that. It was about two months afterwards. I very reluctantly left the Catholic Church because my prayer after I was right with God by biblical salvation was that I could really love Catholics and give them the real true gospel of grace. That is grace alone, faith alone, and in Christ alone. But then in prayer over those two months after I was saved, the Lord showed me that I could best serve him and love Catholics if I left actually the priesthood and the Catholic Church and reached out to Catholics nonetheless. And um, I, I did that. I left uh, the priesthood in 1985 and uh, reached the States in 1986. And uh, I, um, I just prayed and prayed that I would have a love for Catholics to reach out. I thank the Lord that after one year as a missionary in China, I was able to start the ministry that I now have called BereanBeacon.org. It is to show Catholics the real truth of 
where salvation is in a person, not in any church, and it is by God's grace, not by any ritual that any church does. So this has been really wonderful. I've seen priests save. I saw two priests in Poland, you know, through our ministry. We have a Polish webpage, besides many other languages, and of course in English. And I thank God that I have seen God's grace poured out, and that is my heart's desire, Larry, that Catholics would know the truth, and that evangelicals in this very false ecumenical age would see the differences. Uh, I have a very interesting article on the webpage, uh, are Catholics Christians? And we've had tremendous response to that, evangelicals whose eyes have been opened in reading that article. So it's with love for Catholics and to show the truth of Christ Jesus, that God will be glorified and many, many souls saved, particularly Catholics, to the glory of his name. Outstanding. That was a wonderful testimony, Richard. Uh, could you just real briefly tell us about the, you've written some books and you've already mentioned your ministry, but what are these books you've written and how can people find them? Yes, I have written or edited, uh, written some and edited others and uh, they have been amazing. I just thank God. Uh, our most well-known book is Far From Rome, Near to God, The Testimonies of 50 Converted Catholic priest since 1994 that book has sold steadily across the world in English and in other languages and uh, it's on the third edition now and uh, the other book that has my heart really displayed and my love for Catholics is the book I've written about Catholicism called Catholicism East of Eden Insights into Catholicism for the 21st century this book is uh, published by Banner of True Trust, like the uh, book of the 50 testimonies of former priests. And um, I thank God for that because the Lord has used that book and it brought many Catholics to himself by that book. Uh, the other book that my heart was in, in editing, together with Mary Hertel, is a book called The Truth Set Us Free, 20 former nuns tell their stories and that book has been used mightily of the Lord as well and I thank God for the, those women most of whom are still alive and active in reaching out to Catholics themselves and it is just a wonderful testimony of God's grace and the the other book I've written is called On the Wings of Grace Alone I've edited that and that is just 30 ordinary Catholics and uh, what we call lay Catholics and how the Lord brought them to salvation. That is a, an amazing book too. How can you obtain these books? Well, go to our webpage, bereanbeacon.org and just go to the folder on the left-hand side, Books. And when you click on that, it gives all the details of how you can get those books. Outstanding. Well, Richard, uh, we're going to go into uh, showing people your videos now here across uh, particularly our audience on YouTube. But uh, many people don't know that you and me go to the same church here in Austin, Texas. So it gives me a special opportunity to be around you a lot just so we can do ministry work. But anyway, I want to thank you for allowing us to post your videos uh, on the Internet through YouTube and other Internet servers. You praise God and may souls be saved and the Lord glorified. Amen and amen. Amen.